our New Testament reading, Acts chapter 20, and the opening 12 verses. Acts 20, and verses 1 through 12. Let us continue to hear God's word. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. These men, going ahead, waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Amen. May God bless his word. We have been working through the Westminster Confession of Faith. Hopefully you've taken advantage of uh, reviewing the questions and answers, but A question and answer, one of the Heidelberg Catechism is also a beautiful summary of our hope as believers. What is your only comfort in life and death? The answer, that I am not my own. Isn't that beautiful? That I am not my own, but belong both body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation, therefore by his Holy Spirit. He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. This is the beautiful comfort that the gospel brings to us. And we contrast that with all the humanistic messages of comfort, that all your dreams will come true. Just believe in yourself. Good things will come your way. Well, God never promises that all your plans will succeed. All your plans will come true if you just believe enough. That's not the promise of God's word. But rather, you can fully rest in the Lord. The Lord is faithful in all situations. You can fully rest and trust in the Lord in all things. That's the comfort of God's Word. Now, what does this have to do with Acts 20? What does this have to do with our text from the first 12 chap- excuse me, twelve verses of Acts 20? Well, we see that Paul was planning to visit Jerusalem. That we uh, noted earlier in Acts 19, Paul was planning to leave Ephesus In fact, he already had sent uh, before him Timothy and Erastus. He was planning to eventually visit Jerusalem and then hopefully also visit Rome. And Paul knew this visit to Jerusalem could mean the end of his life. This was not going to be a pleasure visit. It was going to be an important ministry visit, but he knew it was dangerous. He knew this might be his final travels. 
We'll see that in uh, chapter 21. Look at uh, verse 13, in fact, of chapter 21. Paul says, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul recognized this could be very dangerous. So Paul is leaving Ephesus. Now, it's a dangerous situation. I think we can say that's part of the reason why Paul leaves. But he's not being chased out of Ephesus. He knows it's time to move on. And the first part of then Acts 20, are after he leaves Ephesus, his continued ministry. Then look at verse 17 of chapter 20. Paul meets the elders of Ephesus again, not in Ephesus, but in Miletus. He meets the elders of Ephesus in the city of Miletus, and that takes us to the end of chapter 20. Then chapter 21, you have the continued journey to Jerusalem. We looked at verse 13. Paul knows this may be the end for him. Verse 15, Paul finally arrives in Jerusalem. And then by verse 30 of chapter 21, Paul is arrested. So in some cases, Luke slowly presents this journey. In other cases, he skips over material. He only has a a limited space. So we're going to note details that are in the book of Acts and some details that are not in Acts but in 2 Corinthians and Romans, but they line up with what we have here in Acts. Luke focuses on this journey, obviously because of its importance in the life and ministry of Paul. And as we'll note later, there's some comparison of Paul's journey to Jerusalem and the journey of our Lord to Jerusalem, that final journey of our Lord to Jerusalem. Now, part of the background also here in chapter 20 is the trouble and sorrow Paul had because of the church in Corinth. So when Paul is leaving Ephesus, he has a tremendous burden for what's taking place in Corinth. And that's part of the story we'll we'll look at from 2 Corinthians. So Paul knew joy, he knew danger, but he also knew great sorrows and trouble. And so we serve the Lord, not because it is easy, not because it's always filled with joy. We serve our Lord because he has bought us with his blood. That's why we are enlisted in his service. He has purchased us. He has purchased us with his blood, our lives that are not our own. This is what we will consider as we look at Acts 20 and the opening 12 verses. They divide nicely into two parts, verses 1 through 6, and then verses 7 through 12. As we look at verses 1 through 6, there's actually a lot of detail, not only in these verses, but their connection with other letters that Paul wrote. We'll focus on three things. Time to leave Ephesus. That's the obvious thing. Then secondly, Paul's troubled heart for the church in Corinth. And then third, his preparation for an important but difficult visit to Jerusalem. We see all of these three things and others here in these first six verses. So Paul recognized it was time now to leave Ephesus. He had been in Ephesus for almost three years. The dates there are from 52 through 55. So as much as three years, but that three years could mean just a little over two years again, depending on how we line up all the details. Again, we noted from chapter 19, verse 21, Paul already was planning to leave. So he's not forced out. But we see after the uproar, Paul did realize it was time to leave the city of Ephesus. Now, Paul had stayed in Ephesus even though it was difficult. Again, it's not just this uproar that causes him to leave. Remember, we looked at how Paul described his ministry in Ephesus like it was a gladiator battle. That truly characterizes the time there. Now, later in chapter 20, We have that very powerful and emotional scene with the elders of Ephesus in the city of Miletus. Verse 17 of chapter 20 is about one to two years after chapter 20, verse 1. Now, that's not inspired, 
But if you put together all the details of, of Paul's ministry, you can date that to about a year or two later. So there is some time in this chapter that's not always obvious. Paul was or left Ephesus in the year 55. He was in Miletus meeting the elders of Ephesus sometime in the year 57. Now look at verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraces them, and departs to go to Macedonia. This will not be, as, or Luke has not described this in the same detail that he describes the visit with the elders. It seems to be a much more tender description later as he meets just with the elders of Ephesus. But again, Luke has just given us a summary here. That description there, he embraced them, describes a goodbye. So he hasn't given us all the detail, but it's the final encouragement and goodbyes that Paul would give. And I'm sure that would have been a very tender scene. And one of the things that we should always see in Paul is the bringing together of truth and love. Truth and love must always be brought together. Later, Paul will remind the elders, this is chapter 20, verse 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul always brought together the truth of God's word and a heart for love. So that's the first thing, time to leave Ephesus. Then we turn to the second detail here, Paul's troubled heart for the church in Corinth. Paul, we know, spent 18 months in Corinth, part of the second missionary journey. That was from 50 to 51. So that, we know, was the first time Paul would visit at least two more times. And in total, Paul wrote the believers in Corinth, four letters. How do we know that? As you read First and Second Corinthians, you see reference to a previous letter, a letter before First Corinthians. Then after First Corinthians, Paul wrote them what's sometimes called the severe letter. And then you have Second Corinthians. So obviously only two copies that we have, only two copies that are part of Scripture, but a total of four letters that Paul wrote to them. Now, 1 Corinthians was written from Ephesus. And sometime during his ministry in Ephesus, Paul visited the church in Corinth. I don't think you ever see that on your maps of Paul's journeys. But we know from 2 Corinthians that when Paul was planning to visit them again, he calls it his third visit. Well, we know about his first visit in Acts we know about his third visit. There must have been then a second visit, and, and likely that took place when Paul was in Ephesus. It doesn't have to be mentioned because Luke isn't trying to give everything in exhaustive detail. So this second visit when Paul was in Ephesus is sometimes called the painful visit. Paul refers to this in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 8. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, excuse me, the, the severe letter after that painful visit. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. The church in Corinth was giving Paul tremendous problems. This is when he's in Ephesus. And so as he leaves Ephesus, there is still a problem that remains with the Corinthian church. So Paul left Ephesus... And our Bibles have, he departed to go to Macedonia. But before he went over to Macedonia, Paul went to the city of Troas. If you can picture the country of Turkey in your mind, Ephesus is on west, the western side of Turkey, towards the south. Paul traveled north almost 200 miles. I don't know if he did it by boat or by land. He traveled about 200 miles north to the city of Troas. How do we know that? because it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If you want, turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is verses 12 and 13. Paul writes this, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed 
for Macedonia. So before Paul went to Macedonia, verse 1 of chapter 20, he spent at least some time in Troas, and he was troubled there. A door was open for ministry, but Paul was troubled. Why? It wasn't that he just missed Titus. It was the news that Titus was bringing. Titus had been in Corinth, and Paul was desperately wanting to hear from Titus what was taking place in Corinth. Later, Paul will write in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul had a burden for all the churches, but we can say especially for the church in Corinth. Now, we have very little detail of Paul's ministry in Troas except what we find in 2 Corinthians and then later in Acts 20, verse 7. In verse 7, we see Paul meets with disciples. There are already believers in Troas. Otherwise, from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we read, a door was opened, so there was good opportunity for Paul to preach. There must have been converts. And then from 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, Paul says, but taking my leave of them. And that verb, taking my leave of them, is the same verb used in Acts 20, verse 1, to describe Paul embracing the disciples. It's an official verb, we might say, of saying goodbye. So there was a church in Troas by the time Paul leaves Troas. That's the church that Paul, a year or so later, will meet in verse 7. So Paul left Troas. Why? Because he wants to know what's going on in Corinth. Even though he's been given a place to minister, he cannot wait to find out what's happening in Corinth. So he leaves Troas. He travels across the Aegean Sea by boat, about 134 miles. And likely he would have first gone to Philippi, though we're not told those details. Remember, Paul planted at least three churches in northern Greece, the province of Macedonia. You have Philippi, you have Thessalonica, you have Berea. And notice the brief description of Paul's ministry in that region. It's, he encouraged them with many words. That's the summary of Paul's ministry there in Macedonia. We're not even given the places. He encouraged them with many words. And that verb, encouraged, the Greek verb is where we get the term paraclete, used for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That verb encourage, it's a rather common verb in the New Testament. It can mean to exhort, to admonish, to encourage, or persuade. I think it encompasses the full gamut. Paul ministers the word of God to those in Macedonia. The fullness of God's word, we can say. Now notice the end of chapter 2 or excuse me, verse 2, he encouraged them with many words. And then we read at the end of verse 2, he came to Greece, verse 3, and stayed three months. Now, in between the end of verse 2 and verse 3, there are some details that we have not here in Acts, but in other parts of Scripture. Again, if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians 7, Eventually, while Paul was in Macedonia, before he would go to Corinth, Paul encountered Titus somewhere in Macedonia. We're not told where. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, verses 5 through 7. Really, this whole text goes to verse 16, but we'll just look at verses 5 through 7. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comfort us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more." 
So Paul left Troas, even though there was a, a wonderful opportunity for ministry, he left because he wanted to find out what was going on in Corinth. Finally, he meets up with Titus. Titus brings the good news. Paul rejoices. The Corinthians have a spirit now of true repentance. And it's after this joyful reunion and, and news that we believe Paul went north before he goes south. Paul went to a new area before, we read, he came to Greece and stayed three months. How do we know that? It comes from the end of Romans 15. Now, this is almost kind of a maze. It's just how the details of Scripture fit together. 2 Corinthians and Romans were written pretty close to each other. Obviously, 2 Corinthians was written before Paul went to Corinth. When Paul was in Corinth, he wrote the book of Romans. So if you want, turn to Romans 15. This is really the last outside passage that we'll be consulting as we look at these verses. But Romans 15, and we'll look at verses 18 and 19. We're not getting the whole context, but it's the detail here that I want us to see. Paul says, For I will dare not speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of of Christ. There's another Roman province called Illyricum. I L L Y R I C U M. If you are familiar with the geography of Europe, Illyricum is the province that would be northwest of Greece. And if you look on a map today, that area would be made up of Albania and some of the countries that were part of the old Yugoslavia. You have uh, the country of Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia. So Paul, we believe, went north to this area. Otherwise, we would have no idea when did Paul ever reach this area. It must have been when he was near Macedonia, and he could have just traveled a little bit to the north where he had an opportunity. One scholar writes this. After the peace that Paul found now with the church in Rome, Remember, Paul's desire was always to plant new churches. He would move from city to city. He always wanted to go where the gospel never had been preached. For three years, and we won't say he's stuck in Ephesus, but for three years, he's been in one place. That's not his, his normal routine. It's what the Lord allowed. But now there's an opportunity. One scholar writes this, Now all were tranquil. A free summer was a golden opportunity to again seek virgin territory. The prospect must have been irresistible. In any case, Paul did not restrain himself. He went to Illyricum. So he went to the northwest of Greece, to this province. All we know about that is what Paul wrote here in Romans 15. The gospel was preached from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum at this point in time. And remember, Paul is writing the book of Romans just after this ministry. That's why we can date this to this point in time. So Paul then went to the south. It's called Greece. It's all part of the country of Greece today. But he goes to the province of Achaia. He goes to Corinth. And that would be Paul's third visit to Corinth. And Luke says Paul stayed three months in Corinth. This is when he's writing the book of Romans, among other ministry. Well, third, let's focus on the preparation for the difficult visit to Jerusalem. In the midst of all of this ministry, Paul still remembers he has a visit to Jerusalem. And, and part of his work, part of the work of others, is to prepare for that visit. It's not just simply a visit. Paul is bringing to Jerusalem a large gift. He's bringing representatives of the Gentile churches. Paul has a burden to seek the unity of the Gentile church and the church in Jerusalem. And you'll notice how much of the book of Romans even talks about the unity of, of Jew and Gentile. It's on Paul's mind 
And it's part of the burden that he has as he goes in preparation for this important visit in Jerusalem. So he's going to take with him a large gift. A lot of what Paul writes about fundraising, it's not for his own ministry. You probably find people, we probably have used some of these verses. Paul is is raising funds for the poor in Jerusalem. That's why he's talking so much about giving to the churches in Corinth and and other areas. He, He wants to bring a massive gift with him for the relief of the poor. Now, Paul's plan, as we see in verse 3, was to leave from Corinth and sail directly to Syria, and then he could travel south to Jerusalem. But this plan had to be changed. There was a plot made against Paul that was discovered, and he recognized it would be dangerous to leave on a boat from Corinth and travel to Jerusalem. These boats would be packed with people and goods And Paul recognized his life could easily be taken. So what does he do? He goes back north to Macedonia. He's going to travel another way. Now in verse 4, notice in verse 4, Paul has a, a whole team of men who are going with him to Jerusalem. This is part of the ministry. These are representatives of the Gentile churches. They are bringing offerings to Jerusalem to show the unity of the church, to show how the Gentile churches actually have been blessed by the Jewish church, even though it has suffered so much. So we notice there's a representative from Berea. There are two representatives from Thessalonica. There's a man from Derby. Also, Timothy is from Derby. And then there are two men that are listed from Asia. Maybe that's Ephesus or some of the other cities. Now, what churches, what areas don't you see mentioned there? There's no one there from Philippi or from Corinth. And some commentators point that out. We don't know why. Now, remember, Luke had spent significant time in Philippi. Maybe Luke is the representative from Philippi. And maybe Paul is going to be the representative from Corinth. These are details We just don't know. But notice this. Look at the end of verse 5. These men going ahead waited for us. And then verse 6. But we sailed away from Philippi. Luke starts to use the first person plural pronouns again here in chapter 20. That was last seen in Acts 16. Luke has been ministering for a number of years in Philippi and the surrounding area. Now Luke is with the team. So there are at least nine or ten men, maybe more, nine or ten men that are all traveling together. For a time they separate. That's what we see here. Some men went ahead. They waited at Troas. Paul and maybe some of the others, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. In five days... We join them at Troas. So notice, in some cases, Luke gives significant detail. He talks about how long it took to cross the Aegean Sea. That's a journey of about 134 miles. It took five days to travel 134 miles. So in some cases, there's a lot of detail. In other cases, it's a little bit of detail. That's just how Luke has written this portion in Acts. Then we have, now in verses 7 through 12, a church service that you would never forget. So this is now a year or two later. Paul, back in the city of Troas where he had ministered, where there was an open door, he may have been the one to establish this church, and he is with this church for seven days. One week, and now, verse 7, we are on Sunday night. And there are several important things that we notice about this service. This is one of the only church services recorded in the book of Acts. This is the early church gathering for worship, and we know they gather on Sunday. That's significant, right? There's been a change in the day of worship. The the first day of the week, there are those who try to argue this may have been Saturday, but we believe Luke is using the Roman accounting of the time of the days. This is on a Sunday, and it's in the evening. Maybe because the people there, especially if they're slaves and others would have had to work during the day, we're not given all those details, but it's in, it's on Sunday, it's in the evening. Second, we can see this service contained much Bible teaching. Paul continues until midnight. We don't know when they gathered, but Paul preaches and preaches. And then even later, look at verse 11, 
After the more formal preaching is done, they continue to meet. Paul, we might say, more informal conversing back and forth until the early morning hours, until the sunrise. So it's a service filled with Scripture, the preaching of God's Word. And the other detail here, this is a service that included the Lord's Supper. You find two references to the breaking of bread, both in verse 7 and also in verse 11. Likely this speaks of the celebration of the Lord's Supper, most likely in the context of a fellowship meal, just as we see in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now, why does Luke give us this description of a worship service? Why why do we read this detail? Well, almost certainly it's because of the incredible miracle of this man, Eutychus, who falls, kills himself, and is brought to new life. That certainly is is why Luke has put this in the text. And, And Luke describes the details As you read these details, it shows it to be the case. We begin with the name of this young man. Not everybody is named in the Gospels or in Acts. This man, his name is Eutychus. It it comes from Greek, which means lucky or fortunate. He was blessed. Eutychus is described in two ways. In verse 9, he is a young man, and there's some question about what that means. You could be 40 and be considered young, from the New Testament Greek perspective. But then later in verse 12, a different word young man is used, which could refer to a young boy, someone who's 7 to 14, or it could be a slave. So Eutychus could have been, you might say, a boy 7 to 14, or he may have been a slave. And he could have been a slave that could have been in his 20s or 30s even and still be described this way. Again, there are details we don't know. If Eutychus was a slave... We can understand why he might have been very tired by the time he came to the service. And Luke also then further describes they're in an upper room, and this upper room is filled with many lamps. And so we can imagine it didn't smell very good in this room. They're they're burning some sort of an oil lamp. So Eutychus thought, well, the best place is the window seat. If you're in a hot place, On the second or third floor, that's where you want to be. Be by the window, and that is a great place to be as long as you don't fall out of the window. So Eutychus, and and notice again how Luke has described it. He has interest in, in some of these details. First, Eutychus is described as being overcome by sleep. And Paul, on the other hand, he is just speaking away. This man has fallen asleep. It's not stopping Paul. He goes on and on. Then it's midnight Paul is still preaching, and Eutychus falls down from the third story, and he's dead. Some translations have he was taken up as dead, but the emphasis, no, this man is dead. Luke's a medical doctor. He knows if someone is mostly dead or fully dead, and that's what we, I think, should understand. This is a miracle, not that Paul felt him, oh, he still has a pulse in him, No, this man has died. Now, the miracle is described just in one verse. Look at verse 10. Paul went down, fell on him, embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. The miracle is told very quickly, just very straight to the point, and yet we we need to pause and, and consider it. It does not take away from the significance, the power of God, that we see here, and and sometimes we we know we don't see these same miracles today. So there's a tendency to to lose sight of the wonder, the signs and wonders that were part of the first century. Yes, there was the faithful preaching of the Word, but along with that, the Lord did use signs and wonders to show the veracity of His Word. And when we read these passages, we must be filled still with praise of God. Even though these things happened almost 2,000 years ago, they're written so that we will praise God. They're written so that we will have confidence still in God. Now, as we read verse 10, I'm reminded of when Jesus raised Jairus, Jairus' daughter, to life. Remember that story in the Gospels? One of the accounts is in Mark 5 where Jesus says, The child is not dead but sleeping, and the people laughed at him. It's almost 
what we have here. Paul goes down and says, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. That may refer to the fact that Paul already had completed the miracle. That's possible. It may be Paul is so confident that this man is going to be raised to life that he says, don't worry. His life is in him. The Lord can restore life to a dead man. Then notice verses 11 and 12. There's almost a strange relationship of these two verses. We'll get there in a moment, but let's first look at verse 11. Even with this interruption and the incredible miracle, the service is not over. This is now past midnight, and they are still going strong, we can say, with the service. They still have not celebrated the Lord's Supper. They had still not eaten a meal together. That's what they do in verse 11. And then after the Lord's Supper, we read, they talked a long while. And the verb there, translated as talked, at least according to some commentators, has a more informal sense to it. It's different from the verb used for preaching more of an informal part of the service that lasts for hours. Paul has preached till midnight, but they're going strong even until daybreak before he leaves. Then look at verse 12. Again, it almost seems strange following verse 11. Eutychus has been brought to life, but then verse 12, they brought the young man in alive. You mean they waited for hours? before he's brought back into the meeting. And this puzzled me when I first studied this text and taught it a number of years ago. But I think there's a way to understand it better than what it may seem. Listen to another translation that reads this way. They took the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. Not that they waited for four or five hours before Eutychus was brought inside, but no, after everything is done, they brought Eutychus home. Now, The text reads pretty literally as it does, but others have argued that's probably the better translation or understanding. He's brought home, not simply he waits outside for four or five hours while the service goes on, but rather he's brought home. So Paul knows going to Jerusalem may mean his death. And yet Luke has recorded the scene of resurrection. And There is an encouragement here. Death is not the end for a believer. Even though we do not expect that when we die physically, the Lord somehow is going to give us life and will be brought back to life now. But we wait for the end. And that must have been a very profound celebration of the Lord's Supper. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, not only are we remembering the death of our Lord, but we are remembering the resurrection This meal directs us to the past, but it's also to direct us to the coming again of our Lord and the day of resurrection. That's what the beauty of this meal reminds us of. Let me have us consider just two other things before we come to the Lord's Supper. One of the the things that you see in this text is the centrality of the Word of God. Paul goes all around Macedonia. He's encouraging them, and we can say, with the word of God. Paul is in Troas, and the service doesn't end at midnight. They're going to go even longer. They're going to speak of God's word after the celebration of the Lord's Supper. There's a hunger for God's word, a hunger for God's word. And maybe you've talked with people who have ministered in other countries. I know I've talked to people who have been to different countries, and sometimes they bring a testimony. These Christians were so hungry to hear God's word. They wanted, they could wait and sit for hours and hours. And and we think of our own context, we get kind of tired after an hour or two. Again, not that we set all of these artificial limits, but the question is, is there in us a true hunger for the word of God? And that has to be something that God works in our own lives, not just for the formal preaching and teaching of it, but the hunger just to read and study the Word. And we think we have so much opportunity. We have so much opportunity in terms of resources, technology, books, materials, you name it. And yet that hunger is not always there, and I think that's 
part of the problem of the Western church. We have so much, and yet there is so little desire to hear the Word of God. Now, I've heard testimonies of of other churches that they were so ready to go to the riverboats to gamble that they were not content when the pastor preached more than 10, 15 minutes. And I'm thankful that that's not the testimony of this congregation. Or other churches, they want to get out and watch the football game on TV. They can't put up with anything longer again than 10 or 15 minutes. But may the Lord give us a hunger for His Word. That's a, a lesson, I think, that comes out of our text. Secondly, then, Again, the confidence, not in our own plans, but in God's sovereign power. Paul obviously had made plans. He was planning to go to Jerusalem. Maybe these other opportunities came then as the Lord opened doors, presented opportunities. So it's not that we don't make plans, but our confidence is never in our own plans, but that we can rest fully in God's sovereign power. And there's a difference. We should plan and pray for the future, but we rest and how thankful we can be. I don't know what my plans, what my dreams will be, but I know that the Lord will hold his people. That's the confidence that we should all have. And I know we we live in uncertain times, whether it's as a ministry or in this state. In our nation, we think of the uncertainty. We should, of all people, be those who have utter confidence. We're in the Lord's hands. We don't need to worry and fear as the world does. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, what we are saying is our life is not our own. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Your life is not your own. You have the life of Christ if you are trusting and resting in him. Let's celebrate the life that we have in Christ. We are not our own. Amen. Let us pray. Father, direct us. Direct us through your word, and through the Holy Spirit. Create in us, we pray, a true hunger for your word. We know we live in an age where we, we have so many distractions. And we pray that our children, that young men and women here, that all of us, young and old alike, we will want to learn more. We will want to study your word more, not so that we will be filled with pride and arrogance, not so that we will win trivial pursuit contests, but, Lord, we want to know your truth. We want our thoughts to be your thoughts. And we want to study to delight in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to be strengthened in serving him. Bless now our celebration of the Lord's Supper. We thank you to be reminded our lives are not our own. We can rest fully in you. Let us celebrate that even now as we come to the table. Strengthen this congregation for your service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.